Hey, 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 good people. It's your girl for Drinking McClary Easily. Back, season two, better than ever. The people are blunt, bum, bum, bum. Before I introduce my guest, who I'm, I always say I'm excited about guests, but this guy, but when I introduce him, you're going to know why. But let's take care of a little bit of housekeeping. So we are on all the platforms, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Prime, Please like, subscribe, share, do all the good things, comment, because I actually read them and I will respond. Also, the people are blunt. We have our own page on IG where you can holler at me, get into my DMs, let me know if you like what you're seeing, check out some of the reels. Those are just mic drops and or gems that we want to run back from interviews, just Little things that stuck out to us that was like, yo, we got to make sure that the people are receiving this. And so go and follow and I'll follow you back. Without further ado, let me bring my guest up. There he is, people. Yaro in the building needs no introduction. He is a past guest. I always have so much fun with Yaro. Uh, it is always a vibe, but before we get into it, Yaro, please say hey to the people and give those who don't know who you are, give them a little snapshot of who you are, what you do. Thank you. And, and thank you for having me back. And it's, it's really a joy and an honor to be at the beginning of season two, creating updated content with you and being a part of the ecosystem that is the people's. My name is Yaro Lee Kubrin. I'm a second generation cannabis cultivator born in San Francisco, raised in Sonoma County and the Emerald Triangle. I, what can I say about me, right? I do policy work. I'm a verified social equity applicant. I see cannabis as a change agent and a, and a, and, and a stepping stone to a broader conversation about curing some of the ills in society and not just the physical maladies. I do cannabis, I do real estate, and I do cannabis real estate. One yeah. wife, two kids, three dogs, and a couple cats. That's how I roll. <laughs> um, for those who want uh, more information about Yaro, his background, how I got into this, you need to go to the People Are Blunt page on YouTube and scroll through the episodes and find Yaro's initial discussion or talk, whatever, with the people, okay? We're not going to go into all that today because we got other shit to talk about. Also, let's say this. Yaro told me, he said, look, I didn't make up anything special. I didn't do anything fancy. I'm just Yaro Kubrin. So if you want to follow, you should want to follow this guy. He is on all the platforms by name, Yaro Kubrin. And without further ado, let's get into this shit, Yaro. So one of the things I want to talk about, like we're, we're talking about cannabis as it is, but where it needs to go and what are some of the things that are important. And in transparency, you and I had a little bit of exchange beforehand and you were like, yo, I want to talk about retail. Now, retail is something that I don't know, like it's this itchy spot for me because I feel like oftentimes equity applicants are pushed into retail and retail is hit probably in the supply, in the supply chain hardest by 280E, right? But I want to get your take on it. I want to get your take on retail and why it's important to you and what you're seeing in it. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for kicking it off like that. The reason why I wanted to talk about retail was just because since I, I, I never, my first public facing role in regulated cannabis was in August of 2021 when I took on the director of real estate position for a commercial real estate development company that focused on taking the uncertainty out of the site selection process for prospective retailers. And up until that point, Special Teams Consulting, Army of One, was behind the scenes and had no public facing role. And so yeah. for the last three years, I have focused on retail. Now I'm at another commercial real estate development company that focuses on landlording to operators, but retail continues to be a focus in a place where there's more exuberance. So that's kind of why I want to talk about that and, and what I see the patterns in new adult use markets, the avoidable pitfalls, the opportunities. But what I really appreciate about what you said is that social equity programs, in my experience, have had maybe even too much focus on retail, whether we're talking about Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, there's this notion that social equity retail 
is kind of all there is. And, and, and I think that that's not a really great way of providing opportunity because, hey, who doesn't want to control the means of production, right? And, and, and why are we not seeing more social equity extract companies or more social equity cultivation companies? And, 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 and to your point, there is differences in terms of the expenses and the way that those can be allocated or deducted. And so when we look at Los Angeles, they did have a micro license that was social equity, but the rest of it was retail. And so it does really relegate social equity operators to the last part of the supply chain, right? <laughs> they got to buy from other people. They got to pay whatever the market is dictating. And it doesn't really create robust supply chain alliances between yeah. social equity operators. And it also doesn't acknowledge something that I've been beating the drum for a long time on, which is that there is an agrarian definition of social equity and there is an urban definition of social equity. And they, both, I mean, they're both impacted by prohibition, right? The, the, the helicopter flew over the ghetto as much as it flew over Covalo and people were handcuffed on the, on, on the stoop as much as they were handcuffed on 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 the on the sidewalk right and so not acknowledging the agrarian social equity experience and the way in which that is much more cultivation centric is a misstep for sure absolutely yeah no absolutely so and i like the way that you put it right because look at the ecosystem that's what we're about right the ecosystem is centered on those relationships throughout the supply chain right and how do we make sure that look, I'm I'm gonna show my brother some love. I'm gonna show my sister some love, right? And that is how, especially as we're dealing with 280E, I mean, that is how you lower your cogs, right? Like that's how you kind of, you know, get some bang for your buck, essentially. It's like, I'm gonna do business with you, you do business with me, I show you love, you show me love. And so having equity applicants in that spot, right? Because retail usually on the front end is less less of a less of a, a hurdle to get over you know to open it up versus cultivation or versus manufacturing where you get into some of those costs for equipment and land and things of that nature and it's a lot more right but we have to make sure that we're like we're divvying it up but with that being said let's get into like what you're seeing with retail though because you brought up you know la i know cali had an issue where there were so many municipalities that opted out that, you know, the supply and demand, like the cost per pound, like a lot of that stuff is, is really screwed up. You had New York where it was just like, okay, you transitioned some hemp farmers, but for the most part, cultivation is coming from MSOs or at least the few MSOs that were actually vertical, right? Like that did what they were supposed to do and, and stood up a vertical. So like, what are you seeing right now in retail? Well, that's a lot to unpack. And luckily Sorry. I drank a lot of coffee in preparation. And so the first thing I would say is just the MSOs in New York were limited in their vertical model in so much as the new retail was for, was for justice involved card members. And so they're, they weren't able to get into retail. And so some of them decided with this new paradigm and the adult use that they weren't going to participate. Then they lobbied to be able to get into retail and they paid their way to, to, to try to change, change those rules. <clears throat> that should be potentially upsetting to our viewers, but not surprising. Right. And, and, and when I think about, when I think about, you know, places like LA, and the deserts, those deserts were retail deserts, but they were not cultivation and manufacturing deserts. So as cultivation came on and we had an abundance of supply, but retail was still limited, we had this chokehold and what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with all that weed? And yeah. so initially three quarters of California was retail deserts, meaning that delivery services could serve customers in those markets, but there was no brick and mortar, right? Yep. There was no way the can of curious could go buy a vape cart. And if it didn't function, they could go back and say, excuse me, this isn't working. Can I return this or whatever? They didn't have the opportunity to have a conventional transactional experience in a way that aligns with the, the you know, how you would buy anything else. Yeah, and yeah. so we well, with the legislation, right? Cause the people said like, we want this, right? 
People said we want it, but we gave up local control so that there was a lot of nimbyism that still was a part of the programs. And we see that in New Jersey and we see that in New York. And so in New York, <clears throat> New York is so proud of itself before it's even gotten anything to be proud of. No, look, New York should be proud of its being a financial epicenter, culturally relevant, food is amazing, cannabis history is und undisputable. But in terms of regulated cannabis, they've been taking a victory lap before they're even out of the gate. And so with New York, a good example is Long Island. Three quarters of Long Island are retail deserts. Does that sound familiar? Does that seem like California? How'd that work for California? How's that gonna work for Long Island? And to your point, or to your touching upon my previous point, what that's creating is these bubbles. So if you want a location in Long Island and three quarters of it is not eligible for retail, that means that that 25% where you can do retail, there's more demand for those retail locations than there is supply. And what yeah. do we know about that supply demand equilibrium when you got not enough and you got a lot of people who want it, those prices go up. And so when those yeah. prices go up on those retailers, that are lucky enough to secure a location in Long Island, they are going to overpay for their real estate, whether they are tenants or buyers. And that overpayment is going to be an added weight that they are going to have to pass along to the customer, which does the opposite of what regulated cannabis was intended to do, which was to increase access and increase affordability and open up the market to those that might not otherwise have a place to acquire good, the good good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we are, if the goal here, and I know, you know, New York um, is focusing heavy on this like gray market, the illicit market, legacy, you know, and trying to squash that, which I'm like, you're never going to kill legacy. Like it just, I mean, it just kind of is what it is. But if the goal is to, to encourage people to operate or to engage with the regulated space, but then to your point, you have these deserts and you have these areas where like, look, everywhere is not the borough, right? And so everywhere is not on a good train line or a good bus line. And so people, you know, are trying to figure out how to get it. And I know that was the same case like in Cali, right? Where everywhere is not accessible. And so if it's, I have to go out of my way to actually go to a brick and mortar to actually go to a retail location versus doing what I've been doing. And then I'm going to do what I've been doing. Yeah. You're going to call the plug. And so the, the, I, it, it's, so when we look at New York and the replicatable missteps that New York continues to do, one of those is this notion of local control, creating retail deserts. We've seen how that hasn't worked other places. The other, uh, obviously, them permitting the cultivation and the justice involved and allowing these hemp producers to convert to cannabis without simultaneously opening up adequate retail locations for that cannabis to be compliantly sold. What they've done is created a massive incentive for people to backdoor or to divert that biomass because ain't no farmer who's taking on money or other people, investors, or they're betting the family farm. I mean, what are they going to do? Let that stuff just sit and oxidize okay. on the shelves. I mean, people right. are going to be self-motivated and enterprising. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and so then they talk about, you know, enforcing against the bodegas, the bodegas are the symptom, not the problem. The yeah. bodegas are the, the tangible iteration of not having functional policy that serves the consumer slash customer slash patient. And if yeah. you want to get rid of the bodegas, banging down doors with a press release talking about how you're doing this and doing that is prohibition 2.0, in my opinion, versus creating a functional regulated system that makes the bodegas obsolete. Yeah. I mean, we talk, you and I have had conversations about this in terms of transitioning legacy, transitioning gray into this regulated space. It's like, where are the incentives? You know, if you're going to make it difficult for me, now I have to deal with compliance. You know, now I got to pay all these damn taxes. You know, now I got to, you know, deal with every time I turn around, 
what's required for my packaging, my labeling is changing. Like you're not incentivizing people to actually transition into this regulated space. And so all of the things you're doing are actually having an adverse effect. It's called the law of unintended consequences. But what it really is, is it reminds me of that, that, that cartoon peanuts. You guys like, Hey, yeah, come kick, come kick the football, come kick the football. And then as soon as that other kid is about to kick the football, he moves the football and the kid just slips on his foot and falls on his butt. And it's like, come kick the football, come kick the football. Oh, you're going to have all this opportunity, blah, 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 blah. The problem with the way in which this has been presented, especially to the communities most impacted by prohibition with these notions of intergenerational wealth creation is these people, they bet the house. They, they take a HELOC off of grandma's property. They borrow money from friends and family. And they're like, look, I'm going to be first to market. There's an amazing opportunity. Then they have opportunity costs. They have time and resources that they've put into lining up to be able to participate. And then the football gets moved. And the football gets moved, not just in terms of policy and the execution of stated policy and the stays from litigation. The football gets moved just because of the timelines that never seem to be realistic and where regulators and government are not obligated to their word. They can tell you, hey, we're going to do this in such and such a date. And if that doesn't happen, so what? Right. And so meanwhile, people are paying carrying costs. They got their labels already ordered. They got their jars they are doing supply chain arrangements. They're dealing with their point of sale systems and time is money. And so the longer it takes to get out of the gate, the less opportunity there is, the less margin there is in that opportunity. And the more people are sitting there at the starting gate, waiting, 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 and they're burning gas, just idling. And so yeah. I think that's the biggest challenge that I see is that it doesn't take as long as it is taking to get to where we're trying to go. It shouldn't take that long. New York said that their goal for the year was like another 50 stores. I was like, if that's your goal, you should be fired. You should straight up be like, if, if, if somebody came to me and said, sir, we've got this big state, it's cannabis relevant. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of money in some of these areas. And we're going to open 50 stores this year. And that's our goal. I'd be like, get the fuck out of my office. Don't come back and put your resignation letter on my desk by the end of the day. Well, look, I'm 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 gonna get off my home state for a minute because you know I'm Buffalo, New York. Also, shout out to the Bills. But I would say that there was a gross underestimation of the capital that was going to be needed for the card program for these retail locations. Also, finding, especially in the boroughs, finding the locations, right? Like those brick and mortars. And so, it, I mean, it's, it, it really turned out to be a clusterfuck, right? Like it was just like a perfect storm of just not enough, too much. You know what I'm saying? And like, and like we started off saying, or like you started off saying, excuse me, but already running the victory lap before the fucking race even started. And it was just like, let's just focus on what we need to focus on. So anyway, that's where it is. They were supposed to be learning from the mistakes of others it doesn't really seem like that is what happened and so it's like how do we right this ship right like how do we how do we get this thing together as quickly as possible because like you said people are literally mortgaging their homes like people are like a lot of justice impacted folks don't have networks where it's just full of millionaires right like this is really bootstrapping shit. This is really like, yo, cuz, can I get a couple from you? Can I do this? Can I do that? And so it's a different kind of urgency. And it's, and to your point, it's crowdsourcing money in crowds that don't have money. Right. And, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it's really challenging. And, and, and by the way, there's not just the bills, there's the jets out there, but remember I'm Niners for life. Okay. San Francisco. I so we, look, we just look, have to agree to disagree when it comes look, to football. Look, <laughs> look. But but I think I think, there's something, <laughs> I think there's something else about New York too, which is, you know, medium term and long term, I'm excited about the tri-state area yeah, when yeah. they can work out their issues. I think 
there's two major things that I would just point out, and then we can stop beating up on them, right? The first is lack of execution, but the second is lack of transparency. And that comes down to culture, right? I believe we are only as sick as our secrets. And when these institutions are not being clear about what the funding guidelines are or the real estate guidelines are, it's either A, they don't know what they're talking about, B, they don't want to be uh, transparent and have uh, rigorous stakeholder accountability. And debate, yeah. Mm -hmm. And C, maybe they just don't know what they're doing, right? And so they announced a fund before they had the money, they had set a dollar amount, then they tried to figure out where they were gonna get it. A lot of that, it doesn't take a public policy genius to know that that's in some respects, backwards yeah no absolutely absolutely and it's something that like us regular folks are like oh i don't count my chickens my eggs before they hatch right and i think that there was this this idea that because you know this is what the governor is saying and this is what you know the government is saying in the state that it was going to be easier and that yeah. that people were just going to get in line and it's like no this is actually what people have been complaining about is that because it's still schedule one, it makes everything more difficult. And I think that they thought that they were going to be exempt from that level of difficulty. And so here we are, but all right, let's shift real quick, because I want to talk about in terms of retail, in terms of, you know, the importance of brick and mortar. I mean, I think it's a thing, but I think we see kind of two different vibes, if you will. We see, I guess I'll shout out, I'll shout out, you know, Kika Keith, right? So we have, you know, that vibrancy. We have that individualism in terms of her location. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of Gorilla X, and then we have like your Apple store kind of retail locations. So when we're thinking about brick and mortars, and I guess I would say separating yourself or how do you get customers to want to come to your establishment and have that kind of um store loyalty like what are your thoughts on that well i really appreciate that you brought up kika she and i are both on the board of coa social worker social equity workers association she is a force of nature i do not think many people are going to have that level of intention, execution, and just, there are certain people where the light just emanates from the inside and you're like, wow. And yeah. she's a wow person. And I think she'd be a wow person in anything she set her mind to. Last October, I had the pleasure of being flown down to go to UC Irvine and to participate in something with her and some of the other COA folks. And I got the opportunity to meet her mother as well as her daughter. And they are a dynamic family. And it was really clear when I met her mom that the apple didn't fall far from the tree and that they are uh, really exceptional. Now, that is not to take away from anybody's dreams of doing their own thing and being authentic to their own vision. And, and certainly, she is not the apple store. And thank God she isn't because that wouldn't have been authentic for her and the community that she serves she also is a case study for how long it takes to open retail, given that it took a thousand days for her to get open. And so many people might not have the vision and the tenacity and the executional chops to have made it through that process. I think that, you know, as people start to open up retail, I hope that people think of retail like they think of a mural on a wall and where they realize that they have the opportunity to differentiate their stores. If I hear that expression, apple store of weed again, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to throw up in my coffee cup because it, 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 what it says is clean, anesthetized, devoid of culture, devoid of individualism, devoid of representing the community in which that location is venued, devoid of personality. Right. And, and, and so I, my hope is that as, as retailers come online in newer adult use markets, that every single one of those founders recognizes the artistic opportunity that they can use the build out as a form of expression 
and also resonance for where they're located. Yeah. You know, if I, I grew up in the Mission District in San Francisco, we had more murals on more walls and more alleys and neighborhoods than any other place I've ever experienced in the world because Hispanic people will paint fucking anything beautiful. <laughs> and 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 hallelujah to that, right? Yeah, bring and like, all the color, bring all the color, all the flavor in. All the color. I mean, you like I took my kids because we don't live in the city anymore, and I just drove them through my neighborhood and pointed out all the beautiful art. And yeah. so, so I, my hope would be that as retailers come online, that they that they see this as an opportunity to dig deeper, to express greater and to to execute in, in ways that are individual and unique, because I think that's what the market wants. Yeah. Ultimately, I think that's good for people. I think it's good for those communities. But I also think that from a purely capitalistic perspective, that unique expression that people can do with their brands is something that the communities, the patients, the customers, they want that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's an easy way to bring community into that location so that they have ownership and feel like it's theirs. You know what I mean? Like how dope is it to have a local artist do something on one of your walls, create something, whatever the case may be. And every time they or anyone who knows them come in, it's like, no, this is really our store. You know, that is a, a ground level opportunity to start with the reinvestment and the engagement with that community. So I, I feel like oftentimes there is focus on trying to quickly, you know, go through the process and get up because yeah, when you do insert individualism into projects, it does take a little longer, right? It is going to take a little longer, but I think it's well worth it. I, well, so it takes a little longer to envision that, but with the slow rate of permitting and entitlements, it doesn't add anything to getting your That's doors true. open. It just asks the entrepreneur to be more in who they are in yeah. the way that they go through that process, right? Yeah. And, and, and Kika using that example of her um, also recognize the need for education. There's yeah. a Gorilla University, Gorilla RX University. And, and so this notion that bud tenders are undertrained. Yeah, you can go to Greenflower and you can hear Max Simon type way too much on LinkedIn about whatever, whatever, whatever or pay $6,000 for a Gangier program that has a very small amount of scholarship opportunities, mm -hmm. or you can solve it yourself because you recognize that the bud tender tends to be the highest turnover, the most undertrained. And so her understanding those pain points and not seeking outside solution, you know, they say, be the part, be the change you want to see. That's I great. think that that's huge. And I think it's also a place where the more mature markets such as California can really contribute to the training that's important for this industry. There is also one thing I wanted to circle back to, which is that when we talked about social equity, maybe being too narrowly focused on retail, I would also say the same applies for organized labor. Now, whether you like unions or you don't like unions, Please note that the unions that I'm aware of have focused solely on retail. And what's challenging for me about that as a man from California who understands the oversized contribution of brown labor to agriculture in general is when I think of organized labor, I think of Cesar Chavez, Chavez right? Yep. And Cesar Chavez was not organizing the people who sold the grapes. He was organizing the people who grew the grapes. And so I don't understand, again, in terms of policy missteps and executional repetition, why when I look at, again, not to beat up on New York, why the unions and organized labor are focused solely on retail instead of understanding that this is a supply chain. Retail is the bottom of that. And so yep. I've talked to organized labor, I'm sorry, organized unions. Uh, I've talked to unions who are, who are organizing within retail in California. And I'm like, what, did you forget about all the farmers? Did you forget about the heat stroke? Did you forget about the, the crazy hours that are necessary during harvest? Why is that not a part of how you're thinking about benefiting the industry? Because that's what you say you're trying to do. Why are you only focused on the bud tender and the retail? And that yeah. to me seems like a massive set of blinders. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, my background is labor as well. So I'm, I'm definitely there with you on it. 
the only thing I could think of is like low hanging fruit, right? Because it's easier to get to those who work in retail locations versus, you know, driving out, you know, trying to figure out, trying to get your list, trying to build your list for these cultivation sites. But when I think about working conditions, yeah, absolutely. Like cultivation and even manufacturing, especially if you're in a place where they're doing trim and things of that nature, if those places are not properly ventilated, if those places, you know, are not compliant in terms of safety, that's really where you're having your issues. And we've seen a couple instances, I think it was either end of 2022 or 2023, where uh, unfortunately there were lives lost, you know, yep. based on based on those kind of conditions. The, ma um, the majority of workplace accidents is in industrial environments. Yep. And the history of organized labor is around worker safety yes. and the the, the issues that you might have in retail are probably more about loss prevention and theft. And that is a massive issue and it does affect worker safety. But if, if it is my belief that if unions want to provide the greatest benefit through a worker safety lens and they are avoiding engagement with manufacturing and cultivation entities or employees, that they have really missed the mark. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like we just called them out like, hey, what y'all doing? What's <laughs> going on? I mean, you better. <laughs> and I'll also, I'll also say this because I think oftentimes when, when workers choose to organize, the narrative is that something is wrong, right? That there are problems. We need to fix the problems. And that's why that decision is made. But I would argue and I would encourage that it is more important to do so when things are right. You know what I mean? Like if you are in the location and you love the way it's run, you love what's going on, then wouldn't you want to secure those things? Wouldn't you want to make sure that if management changes, that the things you love don't change with it? So this idea that we only organize when there is a problem is, is a huge misstep. It's a huge misstep and miss opportunity. So I really appreciate what you just said, because what you're talking about is codifying the benefits that exist yeah. versus focusing on what needs to improve or change. And, and, and we cannot talk about business in America in any sector without talking about the wealth gap that has become this massive crack in the ice and there are polar bears on one side and there are polar bears on the other side and the polar bears on the other side, their ice cap is shrinking. They're going to drown and perish. And so the biggest risk to America with the exception of fentanyl is the death of the American dream, which was that you could work a 40, have some measure of benefit, hopefully cradle to grave that you could keep your weekends to yourself and your family and not have to drive an Uber to make ends meet, that, that home ownership was a part of that, that you could save for college for your offsprings, and that when you reached somewhere between the neighborhood of 55 to 65, you could pull the plug on being in the rat race, and you could sit around and be cranky and tell your old stories about how cool you were in high school. And so this, this diminished dream, this pillar of what it was to be a resident of the United States of America, this way in which that ties into the notion that we all had hopefully slightly equal opportunity and the way in which that's expressed in the wage gap today and this have and have nots and this rich and working class is, is a conversation that I think is not one we want to avoid in any industry because it's something that is both not sustainable, will likely lead to revolution and or just revolt, and where we need to think about not just our own families, but the way in which the families that are not taken care of by society create problems that affects all of society. And I think that, you know, the underpayment of bud tenders is a perfect example. And until we have tax reform in this industry, how is this industry going to create sustainable jobs where people are excited about going to work and where they know if they chip a tooth, they can call a dentist and it doesn't 
pay. It doesn't cost them 33% of their next paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. Carl, we always do this. So living wage versus minimum wage, right? Essentially, that's what we're talking about. And when we're talking about what it costs to live, and I don't care where you are. Like, I don't care if you're in a city, if you're in a rural area, because the cost of groceries, the cost of gas, the cost of housing, whether you are renting and or owning. I mean, you literally are in the position now where owning a home in some places, like actually paying a mortgage is more cost effective than paying rent. Okay. So the whole thing is flipped and like the American dream is no longer that, that, what is it? Two kids and a dog and a white picket fence. Like that is no longer the dream. And I would say that these, what is it like Gen Zers? They're actually, you know, anytime we course correct, right? The pendulum is going to swing and we have these extremes, right? So we haven't balanced it out yet, but I feel like they are, they are reclaiming their time, right? In the, in the words of the great Maxine, Congressman Maxine Waters, they are reclaiming their time. They are like, hey, I work nine to five. At 430, I'm packing up. You know what I mean? This is my weekend. These are my hours. This is my time. Uh, and, 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 and again, it's the extreme, right? Because it's also like, yo, some of y'all got to pay your dues. You know what I'm saying? Like some of what you're doing is a lot, people. But I think it's that. I think that they've seen this false promise roll out in terms of grandparents or parents who they were supposed to be taken care of by the retirement. And that's not the case. People going to school and becoming, you know, indebted six figures and, you know, not being able to purchase a home or not being able to live because your student loan payments are thousands of freaking dollars, right? Your student loan payments are in fact a mortgage. So this is, so this is the space that we're in where these kids are like, I don't have to, I don't have to go the traditional route. I'm not going to go the traditional route. And yeah, I'm not going to work in this job for five years before you give me a raise. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm going to advocate for myself and they have some of the longest goddamn resumes. Like it used to be a badge of honor to be somewhere and be like, oh, I'm vested. I've worked there for, you know, for 10 years, 15 years, whatever the case. These kids are like, I'm going to give you two years. If I'm not director in two years, I'm out this joint. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think you touch on something that is, is worth unpacking further. It seems like the, this generation is seeking experience over assets, freedom yeah. and flexibility over stability. But I wonder to myself, because I am not as young as I like to think, whether that expression of the zeitgeist currently is because values are shifting or because the dream has been broken and they don't yeah. believe it's available to them anymore. Because yeah. if those opportunities existed, I don't know whether the dream would have shifted as much. I think in some respects, this generation is like, yeah, that's not going to be available to me. So I got to make a new revised vision of what it looks like for me to participate here. And yeah. back to that wealth gap, I think that cannabis is an economic driver. And I think it is an opportunity for industrial revitalization. If we want to make America great again, we need to make something and produce something besides software and movies and so-so cars. And, and, and I think cannabis, especially in a, in a, in a long-term future where that can be exported, there are certain products and innovative form factors where I think Canada and, and, and Israel can play a supporting role, but where the United States can be in pole position. Uh, I just, I worry about an industry that's built on unsustainable models and the burdensome regulation and the draconian tax structures are already two nails in the coffin. And what I'm noticing with the taxes is the way that they get massive taxes 
to be a part of regulated cannabis is by allocating them to noble causes that deserve to be funded no matter what. And yep. so if you're going to fund orphans with cleft palates and women who've been domestically abused yep. and revitalizing important playgrounds in neighborhoods that aren't being tended to, it's hard to strip away those taxes because you've created like this virtue tax on yes. cannabis. Oh, it's going to go to education. Oh, it's going to go to diversion, drug diversion. Oh, it's going to go to reentry programs for people coming out of prison. And those of us that want to see a better society go, well, those are all worthy use of funds. What's getting lost in that conversation is those things were worthy uses of funds before regulated cannabis existed. And why is it when we print money and we can drop a billion dollars out of the back of a C-130 airplane into some foreign country to pay for military support, no matter where that is, why are we not finding the money for those programs without amortizing it over the backs of cannabis entrepreneurs and this first generation of regulated operators? And so I think that's a really challenging thing because then when you try to get tax reform, you are fighting against groups that really deserve to have funding sources to further those noble programs. Yaro, I literally, like two, three years ago, I was screaming, hey, you're making us pay for our own harm repair because where's the money that was being sent and allocated for the war on drugs? Why is that money not being repurposed? That's there right. were, there were all kinds of funds. I mean, like billions of dollars went to this war on drugs, right? Like people like to say it was a failed war. No, it was a fucking successful war. It did what it was intended to do. And y'all figured out how to fund it. And now you want the very people who were victims of this war, the very communities, right? That were decimated because of this war to pay for their own repair by participating in this regulated space. Where yep. is the reallocation of those funds? I mean, if Apple's not paying any taxes because their corporate headquarters is in Ireland or whatever that looks like, I, don't tell me there's not the money out there to be able to provide funding for these programs without balancing that on the books of regulated cannabis. Absolutely. And to your point, the notion that we have to pay to clean up what we didn't break, it, it, it's kind of, it's more than a little bit insulting, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's this idea that anytime you talk about equity or harm repair or things of that nature, that is something that it is something, it's like a handout as opposed to what communities and what individuals are owed. You know what I'm saying? And that to me is like the breakdown right there because there's not, we're not on the same level of understanding in terms of equity versus equality and really the harm that was caused and what is due to people and to communities that were on the that were on the receiving end of that. And I would go even further in breaking that down into community harm, the time those incarcerated will never get back. Correct. And then the under the 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 the, the, un, the less expressed asset forfeiture. So yeah. asset forfeiture made prohibition a revenue producing activity. They took everything. Okay, they scraped us. Like I was living a life of shoots and ladders. Asset forfeiture. They took my daughter's college fund, even money that had that had sourced and seasoned, and we could show that that money was clean money and not from medical cannabis under a Prop 215 SB 420 medical model in California. They took my daughter's college fund. So, so and and my wife's. 15 years later, still won't let me live that down. Okay. I heard about that last week and I couldn't say anything. And so, so when we go from this prohibition, which to your point was effective in what it was designed to do, 
It just wasn't effective in eliminating human beings from using their endocannabinoid system yes. to how do we rebuild? How do we create a system of accountability for those harms of the past? You're absolutely correct that that prison industrial complex and the cost of law enforcement it, it, are, are sources of funds that could be reallocated. And, and I think the thing that gets missed in public policy is people who are happy, people who are healthy, people who got a few bucks in their pocket are less likely to be creating the issues that then police have to police. They're less likely to be breaking into businesses. They're less likely to be fighting amongst each other. There's less likely to have gun violence. You know, when you got crabs in a barrel and everybody's trying to get up on each other, you know, you want to find crime, go to a shanty town in any country because those people are struggling. And so they're fighting amongst each other. You want to see people who are comfortable and less likely to be warring against each other for personal benefit, you just bump up the tax bracket a few. And so the problems of, of <laughs> the problems of money are better than the problems of not having money. Right. And so I think that as you talk about like, well, okay, prohibition was effective. What is it that gets us to a place of making that right? There, there's two things that I would come up with. First of all, they will never make it right. Okay, and put a number on it and figure out how we deal with that. Because those numbers and how we deal with that is literally reinvesting in America. It is not an entitlement program. Yes. It is reinvesting in this country and the people who live in this country. And so when I hear people talk about the funding for social equity being an entitlement program, I get a little defensive. I'm like, no, not really. Because no amount of money is going to undo the the, the, the the personal experience that I walked through. And my experience was not the worst. And my experience was not unique. And so it's a good step in the right direction. But it's also economic revitalization. If you spend money in neighborhoods, what do people do with money? They spend it, right? And so we know that one political group in America has been talking about trickle-down economics for 40 years, right? But the way they have it trickle, it doesn't trickle down, it goes right back up, right? It's like there's a barrier and it doesn't. But when you spend money in neighborhoods and when people are given opportunity, they're gonna spend that money at car dealerships, they're gonna spend that money at restaurants, they're gonna spend that money on better clothes for their kids, they're gonna spend I mean, that money we on saw college, it COVID. student debt, which is another form of indentured servitude. But we saw it during COVID, right? We saw as those checks were going out, right? That people were spending money, right? People that that is what we're in this capitalist society. And honestly, the people who need to save money the most are usually the people who are spending it, right? Because you know, what I, mean? I mean, like, let's just be real about it. Because if because I'm trying to find some joy in my life, right? If, if all day long, if I'm working and I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul and I, I may have two or three jobs or whatever the case may be, my mind is not necessarily on hoarding my money. My mind, my energy is not on how do I make money or how do I, you know, make more money or flip this. My mind is like, how am I taking care of the necessities? Like if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, how am I taking care of my basic needs and then how do I like blow off some damn steam? You know what I mean? Like, where can I find a little bit of joy? And maybe that's in looking good. Maybe that's in going to get my hair and nails done. Maybe that's in, you know, going out for happy hour with my girls or whatever. You know, those are the things that when people are surviving and not thriving, those are the things that are on your mind. It's like, how am I making ends meet? And how do I carve out a little space for myself? Joy, joy and time. levity. Yeah. And, and when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for me, at the very top of that is brisket. <laughs> and when well, I, I went to Texas right. last week, let me tell you, I had an experience that was so good. I had to call my wife and say, baby, I wasn't cheating. <laughs> Listen, brisket will do that to you. I don't eat a ton of red meat, but between a good brisket and mutton, there's a there's an actual food truck here. 
in Austin, distant relatives, shout out to distant relatives, Lord Jesus, the brisket that come out of that spot. <laughs> the brisket that come, they have that and they have like some, you know, some homemade sausage that they make. I'm mm. literally, I don't, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible how I could just like, literally like a cave woman. Like I don't even need a side, like just give me, <laughs> just give me a tray of meat, baby. Just give me some brisket, give me some of that sausage and I'm good to go. I'm good to go. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So Yaro, as always. We are going to have to, like, we're going to need a part three, part four, all that stuff, because we didn't even touch on all the things that we were supposed to touch on today. It is always a vibe when we link up. I, I do want to real quick, just roll back in terms of, and get some parting words from you in terms of the importance of our brick and mortar. And I guess I would say advice that you would give on the sustainability of physical locations. Well, in terms of not touching on stuff, it's because you and I have fun and we let it go where it goes. And we realize afterwards, like, wow, when you're having a good time, time goes by quick. That's why when you go on vacation, you're like, wait, it's over. But when you're right. at work, it seems like it drags on forever. What I would suggest as a not so subtle plug for me to participate <laughs> is that we do another one towards the second half of the year, right? And like, let's not get together once a year. I know you've got a lot of people to amplify and highlight, but I'm looking at June and July and I'm thinking maybe we do another one in the second part of the year. In yeah, terms- absolutely. Say less. You know, I love it. You know, last year, last year I was out on maternity leave. So, so that kind of like messed up the time. Yeah, you were making a different type of content. You were growing something important. I get it. I guess. I was doing something. I was doing a little something over here. I, I had my own. I was cooking. I was cooking. I was I was in the kitchen. You know what I mean? You. So, you. so back to the thing about just kind of wrapping or, yes. or, or finishing with retail. The reason why I think retail is important, aside from validating that it's a normal business, is that I think it creates this opportunity for new brands, new form factors to be presented to people who are already cannabis users, as well as creates, I think, the important entry point for the can of curious. And I also think it caters to an older demographic. I don't see grandma going for a CBD suppository (laughs) online with a QR code when grandma still has a landline and have to call her grandchild to come over just to program the remote control. Uh, so, that's a landline. <laughs> so, so I think that we need to think about it in terms of demographics. Yeah. The can of curious, the validation of the industry, and opening up the zoning opportunities and limiting some of the restrictive setbacks. You know, we have these setbacks for regulated cannabis that do not represent the setbacks for regulated alcohol and where, again, replicatable policy mistakes. You can't go into a new market without them cutting and pasting these setback requirements. And in dense urban neighborhoods, these setback requirements don't make any sense. The notion that like some elementary school or childcare has to be 1,001 feet away when there's a 7-Eleven with a bunch of malt liquor Two doors down, it, it just, when we talk about destigmatizing regulated cannabis, we will not destigmatize regulated cannabis until these brick and mortar businesses are treated the same way other businesses that sell intoxicants are treated, whether those are pharmacies or bars or stores that sell alcohol. And so I see, I see this lack of retail opportunity as a chokehold in the supply chain that continues to support the bodegas. And so I don't have anything against the bodegas. I come from a legacy family, but I think if we really want to open this up and we want to normalize this and we want a stable, sustainable industry that takes the incentive out of the unregulated market, we lower the taxes, we increase retail by diminishing the burdensome regulations and requirements 
And then we speed up the entitlement process so that Kika Keith can be the person who talks about the thousand days it took to get open. And in the next generation or wave of cannabis entrepreneur will be like, wow, it only took me 92 days. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the gist of it is that one, we got to get better. Right. And what we want is each iteration to have a different experience, have a better experience, a more streamlined experience. And as we are fighting this stigma, fighting against this stigma of people thinking that cannabis is just Cheech and Chong, cannabis is just Bill and Ted, you know, you're zoned out on the couch. We have to do the work of making it a part of every day, of showing how it is a part of people's daily practice for wellness, and for, and even I would say, not even just for wellness, but for focus, it's, it's making us better, right? It is tapping into the systems that we already have and centering us and bringing us to a place where we can be our best selves. And so uh, you have definitely hit some strong points for me in terms of brick and mortar. Like we, like we started out the conversation in one place, but the way you just broke it down, absolutely. The value is there. We just have to figure out the balance, right? And we got to get better. Blessed to be a part of a company and an, that, and an organization that does have a measure of vertical integration. And so because of that, your perspective, as well as your cohorts within the peoples, you have a, a, a real relevant experience with this conversation. I mean, you're not just hosting here. You, you guys as operators understand and have interest in retail and in manufacturing and in different states. So it's, it's really exciting for me to participate with you because you're not asking questions from a vacuum. And, and, and so that's, that's what makes it really, really attractive to, to be on your podcast. Oh, Yaro, it's always a vibe. It's always a vibe. Say less. We're going to just, we're going to get the schedule. We're going to get it on the calendar because I know you busy and you moving and shaking and I'll be moving and shaking. So people, Yara will be back. We will dig into some more shit that needs to be dug into. But in the mean in between time, y'all stay blunt. I'll see y'all next time.